Yes, I'm ready. Strasvice, everyone. Do свидания. Do свидания. What is that? No, здравствуйте. Do свидания. Do свидания is goodbye. Oh, hello. Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Доброе утро. Доброе утро. Доброе утро. This is the Russian number. Russian язык. I will only speak Russian because today. I have my wonderful friend Tatiana, who it is because of Tatiana that we did earlier videos, and um, she inspired me to to speak, and I, uh, for whatever happens on these videos, I give her enormous credit. Otherwise, it would never have happened. The other person I would like to give credit to uh, is L. Ron Hubbard because uh, much of the information I possess, he said modestly, and much of the experience I had of both Dianetics and Scientology, both in the organization and in the field or out, um, is because L. Ron Hubbard um, took the time and the trouble to come up with Dianetics in Scientology. So I say thanks to him, thanks to Tatiana, and thanks to the technology that, that makes what's happening recordable. Um, I had certain doubts as to whether another video would even be a good idea, but it gives me a chance to see Tatiana, and who knows, I may say something that could either be helpful or interesting or foolish and stupid. I make no guarantees. So one of the things I'd, I'd really like to talk about um, has to do with the human, a human being or, or human beings in general um, as a species of a kind of creature, if you will, like there's all kinds of different species on the planet, ranging from little bitty insects or even microscopic creatures, all the way up the evolutionary line to what we call human beings. But I think it's important if we're going to get a good definition of what a human being really is, is to recognize that first and perhaps foremost, the human race or human beings are a species. In Scientology we call that, or would call that, the fourth dynamic. That's all human beings. Speaking of the dynamics, um, Hubbard in an effort to talk about life um, came up with the idea of eight arbitrary definitions or parts of life and he called those eight divisions the eight dynamics and one thing you've really got to understand is these are arbitrary definitions they aren't well life is absolutely broken down 100 percent as though there's a wall between each dynamic that's not true it's just that it was helpful for the study of life and for the study of the technologies of Dianetics and Scientology to have these divisions and professionals in the field could talk about them. Like I could talk about the first dynamic and that is simply you as an individual person. Okay? So there's eight of them. I could mention them Maybe I should. Tatiana says, don't bother. We're talking now about the fourth dynamic, which is humankind as a species. And the fourth dynamic is everybody, all people. And that's what it's all about. And um, the thing about life is, if you're going to describe it or talk about it, it all depends on how much of life 
you are absolutely or actually capable of perceiving. So there's some pretty laughable definitions of life, some definitions that are way too small. Um, it's doubtful that anyone, that I know of at least, has a definition or a perception of life that absolutely and unequivocally holds the entirety of life in their definition or perception. But anyway, one of these definitions or parts of life seem to be human beings. And one of the important things is if you want to get something workable or functioning is to get a good definition of what it is. I used to, when I was lecturing repeatedly, talk about if you took a, a beautiful, big, modern American automobile and just for the sake of conversation you dropped it in the middle of, say, a, a very primitive tribe, say in the jungles of South America or Africa, people that had never, ever seen anything remotely resembling an automobile. If you just set it down there and you left the doors unlocked and maybe even the key in the ignition, um, you come back in a few months and you find that these people don't really have a comprehensive definition of what an automobile is and what it can do. And what they've settled on is that's where the king of the tribe sits. And that's it. They believe and understand only that much of the automobile. They never get around to what happens if you turn the key or that there's this thing under the hood called a motor and that you can start it up and make this thing. They might have even gotten to where we left it in neutral, so they sometimes roll it a little bit one way or another, but the main thing is the king and sometimes the queen of the tribe sit in it and hold forth and people gather around the car and treat it as a throne. Now you'd have to admit, they don't have a definition of what a car is really all about, so all they get out of it is a throne. We, on the other hand, we know that you can get in it and drive it and kill people with it, do all kinds of amazing things with an automobile. Well, so here's a human being. Do we have a definition of a human being that includes all of the possibilities of the human being? Or do we have some sort of small idea? And in fact, because of that, we actually get very little of the real potential of a human being. So I come back to this word definition and defining. We're always trying to find out more about what a human being really is. And L. Ron Hubbard, I give him a lot of credit uh, did not settle for many of the definitions of a human being. Well, it's a piece of meat that runs around and can sort of think and do a few things. That's part of what a human being can do. But Hubbard was like, what are the full range of potentials of a human being? So that we aren't just saying, well, it's something you sit on and look important. So because of that, he has to be considered one of the founders of what came to be known as the Human Potential Movement. That movement really got going um, probably sometime in the 1960s when a lot of preconceived notions about life and people and about what is really important and what isn't important started going. Um, the hippie culture, the drug culture, a lot of things, whether they were good or bad, whatever, were opening up the idea of what is a human being really capable of? Are they capable of love, really? Are they capable of ideas 
that go way beyond what you might think a human being is capable of. What are the all the parts that make up a human being? So that was of enormous concern to Hubbard. And um, if you read his books or listen to his lectures, you're going to hear some interesting things, things that you could try out yourself to see if they actually apply to this thing called a human being. So, in some of his most public lectures, he really went out of his way in talking about the human race as a species to point out that just about like every other species, whether you're talking about little bitty microbes, or you're talking about the great apes, or you're talking about lions or elephants or anything that's a species, even fish, okay? They all have one thing in common, and it's true of human beings too, who have this kind of body that's made of what we call meat and a lot of other stuff. They have a tremendous urge to survive. And you've got to understand that you'll see that quickly if you start to do something to a human being that they don't like. If they're capable, they'll fight back right up to and including their death in an effort to what? To survive. And that's a given in every cell, in every part, of every human being. Sometimes you can depress it a bit, but the bottom line is this organism with hands and feet and sex organs and all these things is dedicated as it is in every species to the ultimate thing in the hard disk, which is survive. That's how a species keeps going. Okay? In order to survive, we have to have a bunch of urges. We have the urge to have sex so that procreation can occur. And both female and male bodies are built in such a way so that the female egg and the male sperm or spermatozoa can get together and make a baby. And before the baby is formed, that little thing in the woman's body goes through all kinds of the evolutionary history that finally led up to what we call a human body. You can see it, aspects of it as a little fish and all kinds of little things as it goes evolving. So that whole history of the evolution that ended up with Phil and Tatiana and well, eight billion others of us has to do with how does this species, with its urge to survive, create survival into the future. And it does so by procreation, which is to say, making babies. And that urge in human beings is so strong, um, and one of the reasons it is so strong is that through evolution, the act, the sexual act, gave enormous pleasure, or at least was supposed to, to both men and women, which was a great encouragement to do that thing that makes babies. A lot of people do it even though they're not intending to have babies, but whether they know it or not, the urge to have sexual pleasure and to get together the sexes has to do with bringing about a condition where sperm and ovum can meet so that they can make a baby and the human race continues. If it didn't have enormous pleasure connected to it, people wouldn't do it. They'd say, well, we need to make some babies and you know, I don't really get any pleasure out of that and I'm not sure I really want to bother with it. I, I get more pleasure out of uh, having something to eat. So. In most normal people, uh, whether they're homosexual, bisexual, or uh, heterosexual, there's a tremendous urge to experience the pleasure connected with sex. And that's one of the things that drives us, us human beings, in ways that often make fools of us. 
empires fall, wars are fought, divorce, adultery, enormous uh, things because of the urge to simply have the pleasure of sex with different people, with other people. So we have laws, religious laws and, and civil laws and all kinds of things to try to restrain us so that the minute we see something that we think we'd like to have sex with, we're going to jump on it and immediately try to do that. Few people do, but they get into trouble doing that. So we, we try to have what's called a monogamy, even though throughout our lives we may run into all kinds of people that we feel this urge, even though it really is the urge to create more members of the human race. You've got to understand that. So that's one of the big urges. And it's important to understand that it's filled with pleasure, normally speaking, so that we will engage in that act that creates more people. Okay? Other urges are food, got to eat, got to have liquid, three or four days without water and you're starting to die. You got to have sleep. You've got to be able to breathe air. You've got to be able to use the toilet to get rid of the products of digestion, okay? And if any of those things get screwed up, like if I say, no more air today, you're immediately like desperate to survive. If you've ever felt even a momentary feeling of suffocation or not getting enough air, Immediately, the whole organism is like dedicated to, I've got to get air. Or if you're deprived of food up to a certain point, you, you start getting desperate and you might say, I don't care about anybody else. I'm getting something to eat. When it gets right down to where people are starving to death, how they can go the other way and eat way too much, much more than they need to survive. The same is true of liquids and sleep. If you get your sleep screwed up, you start getting crazy, right? You do. Or if you become constipated for a long period of time, it screws you up, really. So these simple little things like eating and sleeping and going to the toilet and breathing, breathing air, got to have it. So these are all the things that are built in to this organism that Tatiana is presumably <laughs> taking on this videotape. So, but we're talking about what makes up a person. And these are important things. You could say, but that's all animal stuff. But this is an animal body. You got to know that. It may have potentials beyond being an animal, but first and foremost, it resembles every other species. It wants to survive. It wants to have babies and look after them and teach them how to continue surviving. It wants the pleasure of some form of sexuality. It wants to live as long as it can. It, it, it wants to avoid pain and disease and injury and experience pleasure and love and comfort. And it wants to be sheltered, it wants to be protected. All of these things go in every species, okay? There's one thing that distinguishes human beings from all other species as far as we know. And this, of course, is one of the things that is both the great joy and the great difficulty of human beings, which is we have the capacity to think we have the capacity to be self-conscious. Other species, they don't think about themselves. They don't make plans. I mean, they do to some degree. The squirrel scores nuts and the bees make honey and all that stuff. But they don't do the things we do. Most species don't have lawyers, doctors, uh, army. Well, they have armies. Uh, a lot of the things that we deem necessary to survival, other species don't. And they live easily and they die easily. They don't have big hospitals and, oh yes, we've 
the deer says to Mrs. Deer, yes, I've got to live another three years even though my antlers are falling off. They don't get into that. They live and they die easily. They don't think about, well, gee, how long am I going to live? Or am I going to get all the good things in life while keeping them away from others? Now, there's a degree of that, but not like it is with people. So people, of course, have become, apparently, the dominant species on the planet Earth. That may or not be, be totally true, but it looks like it, because we have the capacity and do to destroy every other species, including humans, too. But other species, they can wage a certain amount of war and stuff on other species, but they can't practice genocide the way do, we do. Nor do they overpopulate to the point where they're actually destroying their own habitat. They all have predators that tend to keep the species clean and strong. We spend most of our time with doctors and all these other things destroying our natural predators because everybody wants to live forever even though we don't. Anyway, that's a whole story. I think you've gathered the idea, but part of what I wanted to do today was really get into enlarging the definition of what is a human being. And as Ron Hubbard said in one of his lectures, it was a lecture for regular people, not for Scientologists. Or, uh, he was talking about man the animal, man the god. It's one of my favorite lectures that he gave in Phoenix around, I think around 1956. And what I have to say today, a lot of it will be what my version of what Hubbard had to say. And as you know, I give him great credit for a lot of things because both Dianetics and Scientology were based on the idea that if you use them wisely, you yourself would come up with greater understandings, greater than anything the subjects possessed. Um, that was called in the dictionary the word heurism or heuristic. It means something that itself leads to more knowledge. And the early Hubbard expected people, himself included, to use Dianetics and Scientology to actually gain more knowledge and more understanding, including Dianetics and Scientology, but of life itself. So both of these subjects were called heuristic, and at least the early people that were in them were expected to find out more about greater applications of Dianetics and Scientology, but all other fields too. In other words, it was sort of kind of try to bring out whatever level of genius you had in you. And that's one of the things that kept both those subjects so popular to me because both myself and people that I worked with, I had the pleasure often of seeing a lot of foolishness and misconception and stupidity fall away and bigger understandings of life. The kind of understandings that don't take you away from life or make you someone that other people can't associate, but, but the kind of understandings that actually make life fuller, what life is really all about, not something on cloud 29 or mystical or... No, just more of what you are as a human being. And um, on that note, and with Tatiana's permission, I'll say... That's enough for a moment or two. Thank you.